Okay, I'm going to talk briefly about Vygotsky, Situated Cognition and Social Constructivism, and here are some of the theorists from that particular, each of those, those theories. Lev Vygotsky. Um, learning is more than a focus on the learner. It relates to the learner and their social interactions as opposed to Piaget. Piaget was much more focused on the inner, internal mechanisms within the child's mind and how learning occurs. And Lev Vygotsky was much more focused on interactions between the learner and a more knowledgeable other. And so the more knowledgeable other is a parent, a teacher, a peer, and, and in some cases, you might consider the computer as a possible, um, more knowledgeable other, depending on how you use it. He also talks about the zone of proximal development, and this is a key construct. The zone of proximal development um, is, is, is an area of knowledge expertise, and, and there's a real nice graphic within the chapter where, where the things that you know are yellow and the things that you don't know are orange, and the zone is a, is a gradient from yellow to orange, your zone of proximal development. And the things that are mostly yellow are things that you can, um, you can do, but you need a little bit of help with from your more knowledgeable other. And the things that are mostly orange, you'll need a lot of help from your more knowledgeable other. And as you engage in, in the learning and, 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 and doing of, of whatever task that you're doing with that assistance, more and more you wean yourself off of that need for assistance. And so things, that, that, that zone keeps shifting uh, towards the, the orange. Uh, and so there are more and more things that you can do on your own. Another key component is it's very much a whole task uh, approach rather than uh, components. And so a lot of what we've done in the United States is, is break learning down into individual components, teach the individual components, and then put them all back together again. And from a Vygotskyan perspective, his approach is more about giving the learner the whole task so they really understand how it all fits together and then supporting them with the more knowledgeable other as they engage in the whole task. Okay, let's try the, another theory. This is Jean Lave uh, and the idea of situated cognition. And a central element of situated cognition is the idea of inert knowledge. Students have learned things in a way that will allow them to answer questions on a test but are unable to make use of that knowledge in a setting where it can be applied. The inert knowledge problem is that we spend a huge amount of time in schools teaching kids stuff and they learn it in such a way that they can only answer questions on the test. They never, it never occurs to them to make use of that uh, knowledge in the real world and yet that's what we want them to do. Um, so therefore, we need to learn knowledge and skills in context that reflect the way the knowledge will be useful in real life. And so uh, context is everything in situated cognition. Um, there's also an emphasis on learning communities and, and talking to people and interacting with other learners as part of the learning process. So, so it still has the knowledge that we talk about in other chapters, but, but it's, it's knowledge learned in the context rather than in the classroom. A little bit more on situated cognition. Learners learn about the conditions for applying knowledge. Uh, so the more context that you give them the knowledge in, the better able they are to make use of that. They're more likely to engage, engage in invention and problem solving when learning in novel and diverse situations and settings. So, so if you give them multiple contexts in which to learn things, they're better able at, at using invention and problem solving. They can see implications for their knowledge. Um, is supported in structuring knowledge in ways appropriate for later use by gaining and working with that knowledge in context. So again, it becomes more useful. You're solving the inert knowledge problem. And then the last short that we have for this week is social constructivism. And so here's Richard Prewatt, sort of one of the big advocates for that. Culture, context, and constructing meaning within a social setting. So, so you have the context like in situated cognition, um, and you also have this idea of constructing meaning. Uh, so you got to engage in, in the construction of meaning. And a key element in defining what's meaningful is the culture in which you live. So uh, one of the examples I use all the time when we talk about 
constructionism or people give me is that, yeah, well, you can do constructivism, but the bottom line is 1 plus 1 is always equal to 2. Well, in fact, that's not true. And those of you who are uh, perhaps more math-oriented can recognize that 1 plus 1 equals 10 uh, is, a, is a true statement as well. Um, it just happens to be in base 2. Uh, and so we, for whatever reason, a lot of people say the reason that we use base 10 is that we have 10 fingers, but I'm not sure uh, that that's actually true. Um, we just, over time, have developed an, agree an informal agreement amongst everybody that we're going to operate in base 10. But there's, that's a socially constructed meaning. That doesn't that only exists because we as a society have decided that te base 10 is the way to go, not base 2 or base 3 or base 7 or base whatever. Uh, so, so there isn't an absolute fact. All facts are based on culture. Learning uh, is not in cubicles and it's not in fixed rows. It's all about learning uh, and interacting with other people and, and, and uh, uh, very much uh, um, uh, constructing meaning through uh, interaction with peers. Intersubjectivity, uh, complementary knowledge and skills, uh, the rainbow in the book. So, so the idea of intersubjectivity is that you, you bring people uh, into a conversation and they all have their own, if we go back to the information processing example, we have our own declarative, our own procedural knowledge, we have our own um, episodic knowledge, we have our own imagery, we have all of these ideas. And when we come together in a classroom and we're interacting, we each bring our, our unique elements to the classroom. And, and, you, and, and those, um, those unique elements get shared in a way that, that, that we learn from each other. And, and so understanding each other is a really key element of that. That's, a, that's a, sort of the foundation of intersubjectivity. Um, and so I think the example in the book with the rainbow is, is two people having bits of knowledge that, that when they can interact with each other form a much more powerful piece of knowledge. Cognition doesn't exist inside your brain. Cognition exists between people. Um, and I find this uh, to be tr often true, that I'm really um, some of the most powerful ideas that I've, uh, I've constructed over the years are ideas that I've cr constructed in a team environment. Uh, that wouldn't have been constructed by any one of us. It really was the team and, and, the, and the intersubjectivity and the uh, dialogues that we had that really brought that about. So those are the three theories for this week. And I hope this short little lecture helps uh, bring that uh, in into a clearer perspective. And thanks for listening. Bye-bye.